All right, now, everybody. Quiet, listen to me. We're going to start a show. Now, some of you people have been with me before. You know it's going to be a tough grind. But we're going to have a show. And greetings all. Yeah, we got a lot to do today and not much time to do it. So we'll get uh, started here pretty quickly, but uh, excited that you can stop through. If you're listening in replay, welcome. If you're listening or watching live, welcome as well. And you can participate in the chat either way. We read your comments after hours and we read your comments, of course, during the chat. Kind of count on Kim and Albert to kind of watch it during the actual show, but you get the idea. Albert, thank you. Albert is here, everybody. The commish has made it through. And uh, Kim is here, too. Kim, how are you? Coming off of a solo performance on the Nicky Madaro show. Very impressive. And today, Courtney stops through with uh, Mark's Murder Mystery Monday. Yeah, and this is the real story of the Osage murders, the uh, Native Americans, and was essentially a plot to get oil money. Uh, it's a it's a fascinating story. And she's been up all night prepping it, which I certainly don't approve of. But um, she is way ready for that segment, which will be the bottom of this hour. And then we'll talk to uh, in the second hour today. We'll talk to Karen Dawn about all things animals and uh, related to animals. She comes through every couple of weeks. And in the first hour, I will get into thorny subjects, which include the mass shooter in Maine, the warning signs, the clear warning signs with the mass shooter in Maine, and the rise of, or the revealing of, I would say, mass anti-Semitism worldwide in the context of everything going on with Gaza and going on with Israel and Israeli policy. It is a very scary time worldwide to be in the Jewish community. And we'll address that straight up. But I did, uh, first of all, uh, Albert, I'd like to quickly uh, chat with you if I could um, uh, before I get into the super heavy stuff. The Mark Thompson Show. What happened with the Niners, Commissioner? It was a... Um, Albert, I, thank you. I am uh, calling on you as the commish to tell me what's happening with that team. They face the <laughs> vaunted offense... Of Joe Burrow and the Bengals, and the defense as well. All of a sudden making Brock Purdy look human. What happened, Albert? What happened, Commissioner? Uh, we're st- I'm, still look- I'm still looking for answers too, Mark. It's, uh, it's not good. Uh, always optimistic. The Bengals did come off a bye week, so they had a, another extra week to prepare. We also had a game on Monday night, so less time to prepare. So mm-hmm. I don't think we we're stacked correctly especially since we've been struggling the past few weeks but it, it wasn't it wasn't uh, it was it wasn't pretty it was pretty ugly so <laughs> it was wasn't so pretty it was pretty <laughs> ugly <laughs> it was pretty ugly pretty ugly out there uh, uh i i see the um the loss of debo as a as key offensively and then you know their inability really to sack burrow was extraordinary i mean you know the, uh, burrow was a magician he he's impressive Look, that's a yeah, great team. That's some time team. And he's a little more healthy now. He's uh, he's pretty good. And <laughs> he's our defense, our defense isn't as advertised. The the first few weeks were it looked like our defense from last season, but we haven't seen that since. So yeah. we need. I think that's the number one thing we got to bring back. We need a, our defensive line to get to the quarterback and yeah, and then go from there. If, if we could do that, we're going to win a lot of games. I also think uh, protecting the quarterback is key. I mean, you know, you still have these amazing weapons, Christian McCaffrey and all of, you know, the Niners are, are, are stacked with some really talented people. But uh, they faced a tough team, and maybe it was on short rest, and they, they're not completely, um, you know, stacked with their whole offensive lineup. As I say, Debo's a huge um, missing piece. But, man, that was you never felt like um, – there was no, while they were in the game for much of the time, 
you felt as though they were uh, the lesser team for most of the time, didn't you? Yeah, they were in catch-up mode for most of the game. You felt like you're just lucky that you're only a touchdown away. You right. know, you'd go right. three and out. You're like, well, they're going to score another touchdown. We're going to be even further back. But then they also would get a, a stop. So the defense would get a stop. But there's some pivotal moments there in the third quarter that we could have really closed the gap. And, you know, red zone turnovers was a, a big one by Brock Purdy. And you can't do that in the NFL, especially against good teams. So. Yeah, the well, commissioner's office with a grim report on the Niners. Thank you, uh, Albert. There's a reason that this place is fun. Well, Albert is the man. Albert, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, anyway, was not happy with the uh, the Niners' performance at all. So, sad, sad uh, way to go. But The Mark Thompson Show. It is just sports after all, but there is a, a lot tied up in it. And uh, I'm... Uh, Excited for the rest of the season. <laughs> I don't know. What do you say when your when your team is um, is reeling? I'm excited about getting Debo Samuel back. I'll tell you that. They arrested that suspect in the San Jose hit and run. That hit and run. I, I mention this because this is sort of an ongoing weird question that one asks. The Mark Thompson Show. Uh, the uh, the the kid who hit a pregnant woman, hmm. killed a pregnant woman and her baby. Sorry, Grim. Awful, yeah. He's 15 years old. Jacked a car, he's 15 years old, and he killed two people. You tell me. Should they try him as an adult? I mean, there's more and more of this stuff. It's pretty crazy. And this is a question that will have to be answered, you know, how that how that's dealt with legally uh that just crossed you know so i I saw that i thought well 15 years old you know once again we're in the situation where you know what do you do with with this kid this is Uh, completely unrelated but did you see the story about this tarantula that caused a crash in the national park no, no. Yeah. I don't mean to laugh. It just sounds weird. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous, right? There was a motorcyclist who was driving through Death Valley National Park in California, and there's a tarantula uh, in a road. Apparently, a, the driver of a rented camper van braked suddenly to avoid running over this tarantula in the middle of the roadway, and the motorcyclist drove right into the back of the RV this is on Route 190 near Town Pass, where the tarantula what? caused a pile a pile up. Yeah, oh. the spider was unharmed in the making of this accident. There's never been yeah. anything like this. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> brutal and pretty weird, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tarantulas, I think, and you should Google this to make sure. Google it. They are harmless. I think I, they can bite you. I mean, but they they don't, I think. They're not poisonous, I don't, I don't think. They're not venomous or something. Venomous, I don't know. that's another way to put it. I mean, it. I don't want one venomous on me. Venomous would be a ding word. Yeah. No. Yeah, Kim they, went, I said poisonous. Kim went venomous, which is the same thing. But it does make her sound smarter because it is a ding word. I know. <laughs> and, I, and by the way, I applaud that. I applaud that. Yes, I like it. They're supposedly friendly spiders. They're docile. They rarely bite people. Docile a ding word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They defend themselves by throwing needle-like hairs at their attackers. And the females can live 30 years or longer in the wild. Who knew? Wow. I did not know. I know one thing. I know the answer to this question is no. (laughs) And here is the question. Yeah. Albert, did you tweet? Mm. The show is on the air. That is correct. No, I did not. Know. <laughs> Albert, thank you. <laughs> I'm I know on my it. Albert. I know my Albert. Um, so I got, you know, I hate to put off the, the really grim stuff, but I'm going to do it for one more second. I got a kind of a cool email from one of our listener slash viewers. The Mark Thompson Show. Let me just share it with you. It just came in to Mark Thompson Central early this morning. I got this email to the entire MTS crew. Oh, good. Um, it's titled, Would It Be a Brush with Greatness or Just a Brush Off? Oh. I don't know if I can read the entire thing. It's kind of a longer email, but I'll try to get through it quickly. To the entire MTS crew, because I think you'll, you'll enjoy it. 
Albert, Kim, Mark, Tony. I've been riding the MTS bus for a while now, proudly waving my Patreon membership like a flag of honor. How about that? Nice. My dear MTS team, something magical happened this weekend, and I have to share it. My wife and I are in Berkeley for the USC Cal football game, soaking in the glorious chaos of metal bleachers and questionable play calling. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, a mysterious figure with black framed glasses stealthily maneuvers past me. Stealthily is a ding word. Oh. But he dons shades so quickly, I am uncertain about his identity. Is it a potential MTS celebrity sighting? Now, after a year of faithfully tuning in, I'm practically an MTS anthropologist. <laughs> Thanks to the miracle of YouTube, even those unfairly demonetized episodes, I can describe your regular guest to a police sketch artist with my eyes closed. So, when this enigmatic figure took his seat, I played detective. Enigmatic's a ding word. I listened. The voice seemed familiar. Then someone in his party called him by name. It was he. Remembering Mark's frequent foibles with celebrity sightings, I thought, WWMTD, what would Mark Thompson do? <laughs> so naturally, I did the exact opposite. Oh, no. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. By the way, foibles, I believe, is a dang word. I let our guest bask in the glory of anonymity during the game because, let's face it, who wants to be ambushed by fans when you're trying to watch a Cal Bears victory? Which doesn't happen very often. <laughs> <laughs> Go Bears. Um, anonymity is a ding word, by the way. Once the clock expired, though, it was fair game. I walked up with confidence. I walked up with the confidence of a Florida alligator wrestler and asked, <laughs> are you David Katz? The confirmation was as sweet as a victory dance in the end zone. Nice. In true MTS fashion, our conversation veered from recent episodes to his nickname. Apparently, he is cool with it. Yeah. And the eternal mystery of Kim's salary. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Kim, how are you? He also introduced me to his wife and others in his group. Remembering my own wife and our post-game plans, I bid Mr. Katz and his entourage a fond farewell. And an update... After months of searching, I accepted a new job. Soon I'll be watching MTS in replay. Oh, okay. Although I'll make an exception on Thursdays to hear Katz Adamas live. Best wishes and MTS vibes from Mark L. Nice. P.S. He says, whatever happened to the talk to a rando segment? Which is a really mm. good question. Albert, yeah. what happened to <laughs> talk to a rando? I blame you. We were supposed to do it. It was a cool idea where people send in emails. Oh. And we send them links, and they can join us. They're random listeners and viewers, and we haven't followed up on that. And again, I blame you, Albert. What is going on? Whoever is producing this thing has no idea How what can doing. I, as the host, introduce a solid idea like this? We even have production elements with an announcer and all this stuff, and you just let it lie there. Please I mean, uh, everybody is a very loyal listener, so we, no one very random uh, recently. So maybe we should just... Uh... Solicit and maybe check the emails if they're uh, actually, if yeah, we should probably check our emails if anybody. All right, well, check our emails. You can post the email address again, and it'll, it's usually posted during the show a couple of times. It's the Mark Thompson Show at gmail.com. And if you would like to join the show for any reason, maybe it's a heavy reason, maybe like you want to get into an argument or represent a certain position or whatever, send us an email. We do have to get back to this. And it's sad, honestly, Albert, it is sad that we have to get an email from a listener, and he relates the whole thing, bumping into David Katz, and then at the end, as a PS, he has to push us to follow through on a segment which we had put out there months ago. Why are you yelling? It's just not professional, if I can use the word. So I want us to step up our talk to a rando game, please, sir. And uh, we do have one rando waiting, so... My dogs have upset so many people at the park this morning. My bad. I'm sorry. From Jim, <laughs> says the um, longtime listener and supporter. Uh, and dog Jim walker. Slater. My bad. Yeah. I'm sorry. And Buck. Yeah. 
for a quick fiver. Thank you, Buck. Nice. My bad. I'm sorry. By the way, Big Buck shout out. is uh, one of those guys who sends me emails about his latest thing is he can't take all the ding words during Michael Snyder's segment. Oh. Yeah. Well, Michael Snyder serves up ding words. I'm sorry. That's not a, you know. He it, does. I've, I really do pull back on the ding words during every other conversation with every other guest. And so uh, you'll grant us. The great thing about Snyder is it doesn't slow him down at all. Like he just blasts right al along. You can. Yeah. So I ask you, Buck, to uh, blast right along also. So. Uh, all right, let's get into it. The Mark Thompson Show. Turns out that uh, cops were sent to the main gunman's home weeks before those massacres. That's so frustrating. They were worried that he was literally, this is the quote, going to snap and commit a mass shooting. So The they main were National Guard asked local police to check on the reservist who killed 18 people. The dude became this guy that everybody was looking toward as a potential powder keg. Officers in the sheriff's offices responded and tried to contact the guy, Robert Card, on September 16th, less than six weeks before the massacres on Wednesday. They took place, of course, as you know, in a bowling alley and then also in a bar. And... The sergeant called for backup when he went to Card's house, tried without success to talk to Card, and then got disturbing details from the Marine National Guard and Shooter's family. From those two places, they learned, wow, this guy is unhinged and he has weapons. You have the report, uh, Albert, from CNN? Here's a little something on it, and uh, this summarizes how sad this entire situation was because it was identified so many weeks before it actually happened. Here you go. Weeks ago, and really, Poppy, what this now raises, of course, if the officers here, the sheriff's officers who were investigating these threats, had they intervened sooner, could this have been prevented? Just weeks before he went on a rampage killing 18 people, the Maine National Guard asked local authorities to initiate a wellness check on Robert Card. A source telling CNN one National Guardsman was concerned. Card is going to snap and commit a mass shooting. The Sagadaw County Sheriff's Office went to the former reservist's home twice. A source telling CNN he wasn't home during one of those visits, prompting the sergeant who tried to check on him to send out a missing persons report. The other visit was on September 16th. This time, they believed he was home. Card could be heard moving inside the trailer, but would not answer the door. Officers left without making contact. Deciding due to being in a very disadvantageous position, we decided to back away. Sources telling CNN a Sagadaw County Sheriff's deputy spoke to his brother on September 17th. He told authorities he and his father would work with Robert to make sure he does not have any other firearms. It's unclear if any further action was taken after that. And a source told CNN the case appears to have been closed on October 1st, 24 days before the shooting. According to sources, the Maine National Guard initiated a wellness check because the reservists started hearing voices in the spring and say they had only gotten worse. The National Guard also informed the Sagadaw County Sheriff's Office of his history of mental illness including his stay at a psychiatric facility in July. According to a source, the National Guard was trying to get him to retire under the condition that he get mental health treatment. CNN started raising questions early on in the investigation. As you stand here today, was law enforcement notified of the threats that he was making of his condition? I won't answer or answer to uh, any mm. comments that she made, it. but based on what I've seen, um, we're gonna continue to work through that. A spokesperson for state police telling CNN Sunday, DPS has no regulatory authority over law enforcement agencies in Maine. So- And off the streets. The yeah, let me just speak to why there's sort of stonewalling in that moment. The reason is a legal one, right? That there are going to be liability issues. Look, this is a tragedy on tragedy. I mean, you know, the 
this National Guard reservist walks into the bowling alley and, and just starts shooting. A 14-year-old boy playing with his father and contestants in a cornhole tournament for the deaf were among those killed. Mm -hmm. Then he went to a bar, killed more, including the manager who did try to stop him. If the authorities knew of this threat, they were warned of this threat. They actually dispatched officers to his residence to handle the threat. And yet the threat was allowed to metastasize, essentially, you know, as a result of being told by the brother and the father, hey, we'll handle it. There could be liability issues. I suspect that's really what's going on here. In addition to, you know, to be fair, I mean, there are jurisdictional aspects to this. You know, we don't handle this. We don't handle that. This is a sheriff thing. This is a... But the reality is, and you can't, you know, when you boil it all down and get through all that crap, the reality is you got a guy who's hearing voices, who is open about his mental illness, who actually was in the care of professionals for that mental illness for a brief time. And he's still allowed to have these weapons of war. Mm -mm. That's where we end up. And that's what produces the carnage. If he's just a crazy guy, to use the vernacular, just some dude who's crazy, and he's got all these, you know, I don't know, video games around him, and he, maybe he's got a knife in the kitchen or whatever, all those sweet souls are still with us. But because he's armed to the teeth and he's crazy, it's within arm's length, this weapon of war. It's simply outrageous. And this country has lost its way on lost this issue. Ever loving mind. It seems to me like the police were notified. So they sent someone out to the house. They tried to find the guy, but when they couldn't find him, they just walked away from it. Right. And didn't like stay on it. Didn't. Tr I mean, they should have been pulling out the stops to find this guy everywhere. But of course, we know there's a lack of police officers now. You probably don't have the manpower to do that. But here they knew there was a problem. And because he wasn't easily findable. Nah, can't find the guy. Oh, well. Shadow producer Calvin Wong says no red flag law in Maine. No, no red flag uh, flag law in Maine. There's a yellow flag law there, which allows them to go check on. That's kind of what I think they were questioning him under that. But um, it's just. And Jason says this kind of thing is nearly completely un uh, unavoidable in our current culture of individual rights over safety. Well, I mean, there's a limit to individual rights, as you know. And I would say you're right. The key is that we have prioritized gun rights and the rights to maintain, hold, and operate weapons of war in this country over other uh, public safety issues. So anyway, that's the, the story on that. They were well aware of this guy and even went out to see him. But in the end, it, um, it was all for naught. So. The Mark Thompson Show. I do think there is uh, much to talk about in Gaza and in the Middle East. And with the rise of anti-Semitism worldwide, it's insane and scary and depressing. But I'm putting it off until a little be the second hour, okay? Um, so those who want to weigh in on that, we'll do that at... Uh, the beginning of the second hour. There's no other guests coming in, right, Kim? I can do that. And we have yeah? Courtney at 11:30, and we have Karen Dawn at about 12:45. Yeah, but that's not. But so at the top, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry. So thank you. You're right. Those mm -hmm. are the two guests coming. But at um, mm -hmm. the beginning of the next hour, I will speak to this uh, anti-Semitism. I wanted to uh, touch on something that's going on that I'm for, but is really controversial on the part of the uh, Biden administration. For many in Wyoming, a Biden plan to protect land is beyond unpopular. There have been explosive reactions to the proposal, which would limit drilling. And this is how the president's climate policies are crashing into walls in oil and gas states, it's suggested. I applaud the pulling back of oil leasing on fragile lands when it comes to environmental habitats. And so the Biden administration is trying to protect those fragile lands and 
the latest proposal would block oil and gas drilling on 1.6 million acres of high desert sagebrook, a sagebrush, I should say, um, in Wyoming, sagebrush land in Wyoming. So Wyoming, I don't need to tell you, you know, that's a big source of revenue. The Wyoming legislature is against it. And they call President Biden's plan an attempt at, quote, total government control. Another call it, calling it the worst disaster in American history, affecting more people than the Civil War, Pearl Harbor, and 9-11 combined. It's nice that the, um, the rhetoric remains very reasonable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some spread fears that China would influence the government's decision-making. A federal lands manager said she had received violent threats, prompting an investigation by the FBI. So if you're with the feds and you're trying to protect the land there, all of a sudden you're the enemy. This is a huge proposal for managing 3.6 million acres of federal land in southwest Wyoming. They've been working on this for years. And the Bureau of Land Management made this public this past summer. In addition to blocking energy development on nearly half that land, or 1.6 million acres, the plan would also restrict mining and some grazing. These... Areas include petroglyphs dating back some 200 years, North America's largest sand dunes and migration corridors in the Red Desert for bighorn sheep, mule deer, and elk are also included. The explosive reactions illustrate how President Biden's climate policies are running into this wall of distrust in oil and gas states. And, you know... Biden pledged to end, when, as a candidate, he pledged to end new federal oil and gas leasing. And he has said that he wants to conserve at least 30% of public lands and waters by 2030. So this is a, an agenda that he's pursuing with a sense of environmental awareness and also to curb climate change, right? And it's getting incredible pushback. So I applaud the administration for pursuing this. We are already serious contenders as the lead producers in oil and gas production. You don't need to lease additional lands. Wyoming is the nation's top coal producing state. It holds about 40% of all the coal reserves in the country. It also is the eighth largest crude oil producing state in 2022. It accounts for about 2% of total production. It's the 10th largest gas producer, accounting for 3% of national production. That's with the stuff that's already running. You understand? You don't need these new lands. So we'll see. But this administration is getting insane pushback. And, you know, now in the new America, where everybody's threatened, there is legit investigation going on around these threats to BLM and federal employees who are there, you know, they're charged with enforcing these new rules should they come into uh, effect. I mean, one of these guys who works for the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, right? Um, they're, uh, they're getting like threatening messages on their voicemail and you begin to see how this is a, a very personal thing to a lot of them. But I thought, I'd, even though it's unpopular in Wyoming, it's it's the right thing to do. And I hope this um, administration follows through on it and doesn't cave to uh, to a lobby. They also, this administration, they're moving to ban a solvent that's linked to cancer. That yeah, T- this is a solvent. TBE or TCE? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's trio, it's tri, it's trichloroethylene. It's used in adhesives and cleaning products. It's bad stuff. It's really bad. It's um like in spot removers and metal cleaners. It's in all of that. And even small amounts of exposure to this stuff can cause cancer and damage the central nervous system. Also have other health effects. So the proposed ban out of the Biden administration is the latest in a years-long debate over whether or not to regulate it. This administration is for regulating it, this TCE. 
in the final weeks of the Obama administration, they tried to regulate it. The Trump administration backburnered it. They suspended any action on this TCE. So the proposal from the Biden administration goes further than the Obama era plan. I mean, I give this administration credit on this. Under the EPA proposal, most uses of TCE, including those in processing commercial and consumer products, would be prohibited within the next year. For other uses, the agency categorized limited use, like use in electric vehicle batteries and the manufacturing of certain refrigerants. There would be a longer transition period and more stringent worker protections after that. Stringent's a ding word. The administration said that safer alternatives do exist for most uses of TCE as a solvent. So there are two things I say bravo to the Biden administration on. Don't support them on everything, but on the environment and on this banning of the solvent linked to cancer, I say bravo. So. The Mark Thompson Show. Kim's news, she'll bring you up to speed. I will tell you if you're just joining us, I do want to talk about what's going on in Gaza. I'll talk about worldwide anti-Semitism. It's scary. And I'll get to that at the beginning of the next hour. After Kim's news, the story, the real story of the Osage murders from of Native Americans. This is in Mark's Murder Mystery Monday. Courtney will be through to do that. So we've got a very busy show. Glad you could be with us. Smash the like button. All right, now, everybody, quiet, listen to me. We're going to start a show. Now, some of you people what is with that, me. Albert? I don't know what that is, Albert. I, I don't think it's Albert's fault. I think I misclicked. Oh. Kim, how are you? Thank you, Kim. Very well I'm fired. Done. That's it. I'm out. Well, we did get a comment <laughs> saying that we should get rid of you. Yeah, you know? I know. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I'm just saying. Uh, what? I know. I, I Another nail in my coffin. That's well, it. Well, I was before. I'm a goner. Uh, before that, I was firmly in your corner. But, you know, <laughs> one and done as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I'll see uh, you later. Man. Great. I'm sorry. Party Great over. Great to have you here on your last show. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, Thank you. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Kim's News and... Uh, then Courtney stops through. Mark's Murder Mystery Monday. Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. On the Mark Thompson Show, I'm Kim McAllister, and this report is sponsored by Tenuta Vineyards in Livermore. Let's start with a sad news. This is in the Middle East, where Israeli troops and tanks are pushing deeper into Gaza as the Israel-Hamas war is now in its fourth week. More than 9,000 people reportedly killed in the fighting on both sides of this conflict. Those sources for uh, the numbers there uh, aren't secure. Israeli officials say a female soldier being held hostage by Hamas has been reunited with her family today after being rescued by IDF troops. Unfortunately, though, there is a 23-year-old German-Israeli woman who was kidnapped from that music festival uh, by Hamas militants on October 7th, and she has been found dead. This according to the Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Her name is Shawnee Luke. She was found and identified, apparently had been kidnapped from the music festival and tortured, and she did not survive this event. Former President Trump is looking to pick up the endorsement of his former running mate at a campaign stop in Las Vegas over the weekend. Trump said Mike Pence should endorse him because he had a great successful presidency and Pence was his vice president. Trump took this- <laughs> oh, that's right. You, you know, he could actually uh, Pence oh, could uh, could get his quattro uh, conos mas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he could. It's kind of, you know, Trump could easily ride in now. More so and more Trump- ways he could um, <laughs> preside over the end of the world. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I don't know if Trump's going to be endorsing uh, the former president or not. It, it remains to be unclear. But uh, mm. Trump There's never took been this- anything like this. Yeah, that's right. Trump took the stage right after the former vice president announced he was dropping out of the 2024 GOP race. Mm. Didn't Trump 
join the race in order to say don't vote for i mean didn't pence join the race in order to say don't vote for trump well in the last uh, originally when he first joined the race mike pence didn't openly criticize trump in fact here's a guy who was behind uh, you know the effort to hang him right and they were you know they were going after mike pence on j6 and he wouldn't criticize trump or even even tip his toe into that water and then the last Mm -hmm. couple of months he's just begun to become critical of trump and uh it didn't matter he um you know he didn't have the the oomph didn't have the juice to make it happen but um it's funny on the gop side that they're not behind pence you know he couldn't get the the mojo going Mm -hmm. but this guy who leads the House now, the new Speaker of the House, he is mo- he is a religious right crazy, if I'll just yep. put it that way. He's an absolute biblical literalist, and he wants to govern the country that way. You can be a biblical literalist. I don't have a problem with you being that. But legislating on it, crazy. And yet Mike Pence is the one who we view as, you know, he's got 10-foot pole marks all over him, Mike Pence, and this other guy, he was, he slid right into the House Speakership. I think it's troubling. Yeah, very. Let's talk COVID for a minute. Because COVID mask requirements are likely a thing of the past on commercial flights. I thought they already had been. But now the Senate has passed an amendment to a spending bill that bans federal funds from being used to enforce face covering mandates on airlines, trains, or buses. I'm getting my COVID vaccine on a flight. How is that? That's how much I believe in the COVID vaccine, everybody. Yeah. Repu- Republican Senator John Cornyn of Texas, who voted for the amendment, called it a victory for personal freedom. Okay, <laughs> right. whatever you say. In New York, the overwhelming migrant crisis being addressed by Mayor Eric Adams' administration, they've set up something now called a re-ticketing office to issue free free plane tickets out. Adams says city shelters are now at capacity with no more room. So the city of New York is now offering asylum seekers voluntary one-way tickets to anywhere in the world. More than 130,000 migrants have arrived since last year, with more than 65,000 now in shelters in New York. Reticketing office, here it comes. Sayonara. One of the... uh, (laughs) They do, I mean, clearly they want to do anything they can to relieve themselves. They got a problem. Yeah, the immigrant crush. No room at the end. One of the suspects in the weekend Tampa, Florida shooting will be held without bond. 22-year-old Tyrell Phillips made his first court appearance this morning, being charged with second-degree murder. Two people were killed, 16 injured after that shooting on Sunday on a crowded street. The FDA is urging parents to take their children to the doctor for a blood test if they ate Wanabana apple cinnamon fruit puree pouches. Wanabana. This warning comes after four kids had elevated levels of lead and was found that children all ate the Wanabana apple cinnamon pouches. The agency tested multiple lots of the pouches. They found extremely high concentrations of lead. A result of these findings, Wanabana issuing a voluntary recall for their fruit puree, fruit puree pouches, which were sold across the country at various retailers, including Sam's Club, on Amazon, and at Dollar Tree. Well, I'm glad that they found it. I'm glad that they test for it. I know they do a lot of that. Too. You know where that research is being done by Dr. Emil Dr. Yeah. Emil the third. The third. Yeah, he's doing the the primary research on it. But it's nice that it's getting out there, and they actually have a recall going. Yeah. A city in Northern California helping businesses get a facelift, helping small companies, nonprofits, and shopping centers that have experienced high levels of crime. In Antioch, Mayor Lamar Thorpe is announcing $500,000 in a second round of funding for the Facade Upgrade Program, which is a reimbursable federal grant for eligible organizations, allowing them to make specific improvements and repairs to storefronts and building exteriors. There you go. 
a now shuttered Oakland restaurant being forced to pay thousands of dollars in back wages. Owners of the fine dining restaurant Hi Felicia are being told they have to pay over $100,000 to former workers. The move comes after an investigation by city officials which found High Felicia violated the city's minimum wage law. They've got 45 days to make those employees whole. Wasn't the buy Felicia a thing? You said buy Felicia, right? Isn't that right? Yeah, this was High Felicia. Uh, I know, I get it. A I mean, they could close the it and open a Bi Felicia uh, restaurant, maybe you know, right I'm next door. I'm not thinking they're going to attract really a lot of workers if they can't even pay the ones at High Felicia, who wants <laughs> to say, point. Good point. "I'll work at Bi Felicia." No, thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's a good point. Chipotle says it may have to raise prices at its California restaurants to pay for employee wages. What? The Mexican food chain announcing price hikes nationwide, but they say they're considering raising the cost of food at their California locations to keep up with the state's new minimum wage law for fast food workers. What the you hell knew? is going on in the yeah. United States of America? Now Ron gets we were going to have to pay for that one way or the other. Back in September, Governor Newsom signed fast food and fast casual workers. Uh, the legislation raising their minimum wage to 20 bucks an hour. That new hourly wage in California takes effect next April. So a little pricier burrito for you. There is a (laughs) makeshift memorial now to friend star Matthew Perry. It's growing in New York's West Village. Flowers and candles and messages being left at the corner of Bedford and Grove right outside of a building where the exteriors were shot for Friends. The 54-year-old actor who played Chandler on the beloved 90s sitcom died of an apparent drowning on Saturday at his home in the Los Angeles area. And just such a sad thing. He had you know, made such progress with the addiction, you know. Man. And then this appears, Courtney, you were saying this, you think that it might have been an accidental thing or a... Yeah, yeah well, we were we were just talking about the fact at the time when it was first reported, there were no drugs found near the scene. Right. But in fact, there was, uh, I believe, prescription drugs later, at least determined to be. But it might have been a home. might yeah. have been a confusion well, or confusion of a mix of prescription drugs that he didn't intend or not yeah. intentional or a medical yeah, emergency. Unintentional, exactly. right? Yeah. Because yeah. it's so sad, really. Mm-hmm. It really is. Lastly, the asteroid that ended the dinosaurs also stopped a key process for life on Earth. There's a study published in the journal Nature Geoscience suggesting that asteroid that whammed into the Earth off the coast of what is now Mexico resulted in dust that blocked the sun so much that plants couldn't photosynthesize. Scientists suggest it lasted for two years, causing very severe challenges. We needed that information. Really, really needed it today. Well, no, I mean, you know, (laughs) use it. It's, uh, that was, you know, who did a lot of that research is uh, the doctor uh, Emil yeah. Schaffhauser. He's all over the place, that guy. You know, he, he's, he, he, he's very like uh, he's an uh, unsung researcher, and I'm glad yes. we could uh, get that information out. This report is sponsored by Tenuta Vineyards in Livermore. Yeah, they've got the. Why are you yelling, Mark Thompson? Red? Why are you yelling? Yes. And the hey, which one of you is Mark Thompson? Pinot Grigio. I love the uh, the white. I love that. Hey, which one of you is Mark Thompson? Uh, White. What do you like better? You like the white or the red? What do you think? That's a good question. I, I think they're both really good. Mm. I don't really have a favorite. It's like, it depends on the mood and, you know, what yeah. I'm eating. I'm going for the red. Do they both have alcohol? What, Bring how, me all what, the red how wine. How dare you, Courtney? <laughs> how dare you? What did you say? I said, do they both have alcohol? How dare that's you. really that's 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 you all said. you care <laughs> about. <laughs> You really? can go hang out right here in front of this yeah. window. Hey, which one do you use, Mark Thompson? <laughs> yeah, okay. Gaze appreciatively at the vineyards it in is the beautiful. Livermore yeah. look area. Look out over the Livermore Valley. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's lovely. They're friendly. They're kind. And best of all, you get a 10% off discount. Mm. That's right. You got it. Just exclusively for being a Mark Thompson show listener viewer, you get your 10% off. But you have what? to work for it. Just a oh. little work. You yeah. got to call Rich at Tenuta Vineyards and you wow. have to say... Smash, Smash it, it with your iron rod. Right. Just like that. And boom, 10% off. And All boom. your wine, 
all your events, your wine, your great food, events, everything, great 10% stomping off. events, catered luncheons, all kinds yes. of stuff. So 10% off. Call Rich at 925-699-4575. And our thanks to Tanuta Vineyards in Livermore. You know, I'm if Kim you want to, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I was just going to say. You um, always do. I do. I do interrupt. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. It's a, uh, <laughs> I just wanted to make the point, Kim, you did stick the landing so beautifully. I think if you had left a little opening for me to jump in, it would have been a little bit better. But all right, oh, you Lord. do it your way. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, the point is, Kim. Kim, how are you? The idea also is you don't have to go there. You can order stuff. We have a couple of listeners who literally order a case a month. Yeah. And they get the 10% discount. So you can nice. you never have to actually go to the Livermore Valley from wherever you are in America. They can get the wine to you. So you right. can email Rich, rich Ship at tenutavineyard.com. But hit them with that smash. Smash uh, it with your iron rod. That and you'll get the ten percent discount. I, yeah, that's the I only thing that. I wanted to mention. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Much appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Kim McAllister. This is, yeah, it's the Mark Thompson you. show. Yeah. The Mark Thompson show. That's not fake. That's real. This is Mark Thompson. Feels great. When they raided Mar a Lago, God didn't like that. Mm, yeah, great to have everybody here on this Monday. There's a lot bad in the world, but there's also a lot good in the world, and we're glad that you could join us. Um, now, this is interesting from Luis on Matthew Perry. Uh, Matthew Perry died almost the same way as Whitney Houston who drowned in a bathtub. I'm sure the conspiracy nuts are crafting their narratives right now as to how the two are connected. Well, just because you mentioned conspiracy, I will tell you this. There is, I'm sure you've read, if you've read about this at all, it was kind of knocking around. The anti-vax movement has jumped on Matthew Perry saying that that was COVID vax related. So, I mean, again, you know, you can't jump on every tragic loss and say that it was the result either of COVID or of, you know, just, we don't even know really what was in his system. There's not even a toxicology report yet. And already, you know, they're jumping on this situation with both feet. So, um, pretty wild. I saw some other comments here that I will get to. Uh, smash the like button if you would. Smash it helps it us with your iron in rod. the YouTube universe to get the thumbs up. And we're a completely crowdfunded show. So I'll remind you, if you haven't yet, head over to themarkthompsonshow.com. There are hot links to Patreon, PayPal. A couple of you have stepped up your monthly contributions. Really do appreciate it. I know that there are a bunch of shows out there and they're all pitching you for support. Um, we're completely dependent on the support of listeners and viewers, so it really means a lot that you would uh, that you would be an ongoing supporter. So that's that. All right, uh, I have um, the Mark Thompson Show on Mondays. A special treat when she's available. <laughs> Courtney, my better half, comes through with Mark's Murder Mystery Monday. Welcome to Mark's Red Rock Murder Red Rock Mystery Red Rock Monday. Courtney, what is the tale that you intend to? T First of all, welcome. I Hi. Say. Yeah. Thank nice you for having you. me. Courtney is uh, before we get into it, working on our uh, cruise, which she wants to take. It's true. Yeah. Um. It's fair to say that Courtney wants to take the, it, the cruise more than do I. I'd <laughs> that like to is fair to say. I'd like yeah. to spend time with uh, yeah. the audience. I'd rather, if there was a way to take a cruise, everybody who watches and listens oh, to the okay. show, I would do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, not that, it's not that I'm not happy to take it with oh, you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, no. literally shipping me off seems like a very I did offer Courtney, well, why don't you go? Opportunity I did right say, now. why don't you go? <laughs> but... Um, but it just is a long time, and I, I don't know. I'm just, I don't. And I don't, the animals. I'm worried about the animals. It's true. Yeah. If I didn't have the animals, I would be fine. Yeah. But I'm very concerned because I have older animals, and I'm worried about them in the care of other people. So. Yeah, especially when the other people can't remember how many animals we have. So we have, I have to tell this story quickly. <laughs> I'll have Courtney. Listen to this, Kim. 
and Albert mm -hmm. and everyone. Um, so we were going to kind of road test these cat sitters. Remember, we have three cats. One of them is really not well, mm -hmm. but he's not, and he's right in that place, but he's re and he's really attached to me. And, uh, you know, he's got like a Parkinson's thing or something. I don't know. It's really sad. Shaky but he's cat. also terrific and great. His name is Charlie. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the cats are have got this sort of attachment to us. We have four cats, all right? Uh, and three cats get one part of the house, and then one cat gets sort of the other part, and there's sort of a demilitarized zone in the middle where they all kind of <laughs> congregate. That's a living room, dining room area. Okay. It's not a huge house, but that's kind of the way we've partitioned mm -hmm. it. So these people come through. We're kind of road testing them for the long weekend to see how they do. So... Courtney, do you want to take it from there? Quickly, we can tell this story, I think. Yeah. So I'm, we have this woman who's taking care of the cats, and she tells us that she wants to bring her sister, which is great. It's more the merrier. Because they're going to stay here, which is good for one of the cats who likes to, you know, mm -hmm. have somebody around all sure. the time. Yeah. yeah. And her sister comes with her, and her sister is how? 80. 80. 81, I think. 81. So, you know, we're talking to her about the cats and giving her the directions on how to take care of the animals. And this had been this had been happening over the course of a certain amount of days. And so when they came that day, we felt that they were very prepared and understood how many cats we had and the specifics around the directions of taking care of them. And literally as we're leaving, the sister of the caretaker says, so there's two cats, right? <laughs> like, After all no, these briefings. <laughs> No, You're there are four cats. The cats. No, and then the she's like, she said, uh, and Charlie is the is the orange cat, right? And I said, no, he's the tuxedo <laughs> cat. And she said, you have a tuxedo cat, and I thought, where have you been? Yeah, oh, no. what have we been doing like, for the last has, hour? Yeah, what has don't been bring happening? the sister. No. I, and then, yeah, we just. I mean, they were fine, I think. We were only gone for three days, I don't, so you can <laughs> see a little. Nice. You can see they're really great, and I think. Uh, are you yeah. going to use them again? We have to yeah. because they're you know they're available. They're it's really nice. hard yeah, to. But, um, yeah. but Mark doesn't want to go on this trip. I think it might just be me going. I'll Buck go. Says, I'll send uh, I think you and I should go together. <laughs> and yeah. I would send Kim. Yeah. I would send Kim for yeah, real. I'll go. I will send, yeah. I'm not, I'm not I'm out. Mark <laughs> is totally using the cat sympathy yeah. card to get out of this horrible cruise. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Buck. it's true. Yeah. He's using everything. I know. Um, all right, so... Um, <laughs> Lake Commentaire says, wow, lady, you have one job. Yeah. Really? Yeah, exactly. True. I mean, exactly. Just like, they really didn't get it. It was as we were leaving, there was a sense of just panic. <laughs> like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is so, bad. Albert, yeah. I want to ask you something, if I can. Um, now can we do a Mark's Murder Mystery Monday, and you can cut out the cat stuff between, from when you release the video? Yeah, I can just hit the. Yeah, this is great. Uh, or do you want to hit? Just, or do you want to hit the open again? How do you want to do? Hit it? the open again, and we'll just start anew. All right. So uh, you understand because we drop all these videos, C Courtney. We drop them yeah. separately. We'll drop this as a second okay. separate video. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Um, I like being introduced twice. <laughs> all right. Um, time for Mark's Murder Mystery Monday. Welcome to Mark's Red Rock. Murder Red Rock. Mystery Red Rock. Monday. Please welcome the mistress of Mark's Murder Mystery Monday, my better half, Courtney. Hi. Yeah. Hello. Courtney, what is the story you will tell today? The story that we're covering today is the Osage murders. And Which, this yeah, is the story that inspired the new Martin Scorsese film, Killers of the Flower Moon. So you and I were chatting and we thought this was very a very timely story. It is indeed. Yeah. I, has, did the movie come out? It's yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, it's out. Oh, yeah. So, um, so the Osage Native American tribe... The We're answer, showing the yeah, territory. I'm showing you the ancestral land because I, I think that the context of how long they had been here in the United States, they were a tribe. Some reports have them dating back to 200 AD, but this was the ancestral land of this tribe. Now, the murders of these tribe members happened between 1910 and 1930, and there were roughly reported about 60 members of the tribe that were murdered, but some research shows that there are hundreds. 
The and people who are listening, I just mm -hmm. want to describe the area that the Osage Ancestral Territory covers is southwestern Pennsylvania, all the way west through Kansas into eastern parts of Colorado, all of Oklahoma, all of Kansas, all of Missouri, all of Arkansas, most of Illinois, all of Kentucky, and half of Tennessee and the southern half of Wisconsin. That's an immense area. Millions of acres. Yeah. And they had been there since, I guess I mentioned, and this is through various types of reporting, but from like 200 AD I was reading. And in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase, the government started to come in and forcing, they started to force out the Osage tribe members. I have read different reports of what happened where they ultimately um, founded their current reservation, which is on the right hand side if you're watching. If you go to the next slide, it shows the context of like the diminishing amount of land that they had based on the federal government. Now, I had read reports that they, in fact, sold their land to the government and bought their current reservation land from the Cherokee Indians. But I have also read reports that they were forced into Oklahoma as the government was trying to create statehood around Oklahoma. And in that, they gave the land to the Osage tribe, or that's what they, they designated for the Osage tribe. And the Osage tribe members negotiated at the time both ownership of that land, but everything below the land. So any mm. minerals or anything that was found below that land. And certainly then, if you go to the next slide, in 1897, oil is struck. So um, Phillips Petroleum is an example here that you can see they find oil there in 1897. And by 1920s, with World War I and the proliferation of automobile technology, oil is a huge commodity and resource that, the, uh, that America is using. And so in 1923, actually, the tribe members um, make $30 million that year, which would be $400 million in sort of contemporary inflation rates or to, uh, you know, yeah, money. Yeah, kind of, right. Um, and so there and was a huge up, amount of money coming into the Osage up, tribe. And uh, split uh, amongst uh, how many Osage tribe members are there? Yes. So there were 2,200 tribe members at the time when the land was given. And each tribe member gets a head right, as they call it. So it's an inheritance to whatever came from the profits around any sort of land ownership, but also the licensing of that land for the refining of the oil and mining of the oil. Um, this shows an example of uh, Pahaka, which is the city in the Osage County, or the town in the Osage County. On the left-hand side is the town in 1906, and on the right-hand side is the town in the 1920s. So you can see how much money was coming in and how much this town was being built up by this influx of wow. money that was coming from the oil. Wow. Yes. Uh, a lot of the Osage tribe members were building mansions. So I have an example here, if you're watching, of different mansions, homes being erected, and sort of these contemporary furnitures, best of, the, best of what was available. The Osage tribe members became the wealthiest people on the planet per capita at the time when the oil, yeah, started wow. <laughs> to be leased out, yeah. I have this uh, visual if you're watching. Um, it was said that there were on average one in every 10 or 11 households had an automobile in the 1920s. And the Osage tribe members had on average 11 automobiles each Jeez. to give you some context. Now, I have this because an important thing that I was reading in some reporting was eventually with the murders that started to happen, unfortunately, what was lost was not only those family members, but a lot of traditional ceremonies and things that were important, aspects that were important to the heritage and the culture of the Osage tribe members that they still tried to practice, which you can see on the right-hand side, but in fact, there were so many lives that were lost that a lot of that is still affecting contemporary times within the tribe. Was the, there was an attempt to maintain traditions despite the fact that there was this huge influx of wealth, as you're saying, yeah. they really did try, but then you're saying after the murders, it was a, 
just yeah. the tribe was so wounded and diminished completely. That, yeah, I'm saying know. a lot of that storytelling and the heritage was lost. Yeah. Sad, yeah, yeah, it was very sad. So the murders, so the oil is found in 1987. Uh, the leasing of the land happens in like 19, starts in like 1920s, uh, late 1910s. And uh, the government felt that the Osage tribe members could not manage their money by themselves. So they started to um, delegate um, guardians for each of the tribe members and their head rights so that those guardians could help them manage their money. I read somewhere that there were eight practicing attorneys in Pahaska with 8,000 um, people living there. And it was the same amount of attorneys that um, were in the capital of Oklahoma that had 140,000 people living, just to give you context as to how many people came in and saw an opportunity to take advantage of and harm the tribe for this great influx of money that was coming in. One of those people was this gentleman here, <laughs> this horrible person here, William King Hale. He was a cowboy from Texas and he had actually come into Indian territory and he had started his own ranch and he was working in and around the Osage tribe and had started to sort of create a friendly relationship with them. And then when the oil was found, he was really the mastermind of so many of the murders that happened. And what would happen with the head rights is there was only 2,200 that were given out or delegated to the tribe members. There were not gonna be any more head rights. So to inherit the head right, which would give you a portion of the profits that were happening from the oil leases, uh, it had to be inherited or delegated from the person that had the head right. So he, in fact, would befriend a lot of the Osage tribe members. They started to die. He started to inherit those oil rights. Because he, through marriage, was able to inherit He, through it. marriage, and also through illegally having them sign paperwork, illegally representing that the rights had been given to him through those means, he started to collect a lot of the head rights and the money. Weren't there people who were assigned to kind of protect Osage Nation from just this kind of exploitation that you're describing? Yeah, the guardians, but they were the ones that were perpetrating it. There were some guardians and there were some people that were, in fact, helping the tribe. Um, but for the most part, they were taking advantage of them. And he was sort of the ringleader, if you will. He actually signed his name... Reverend William King Hale, even though he wasn't part of any sort of ministry, he just felt that he was that level mm. of of sort of giving and sort of the king of the Osage territory. Sure. And in fact, had anointed himself that. So if you go to the next slide, he um, has a nephew and that nephew is named Ernest Burkhart. Now I should mention William King Hale is played by Robert De Niro in the film and his nephew is Ernest um, Burkhart, and he's played by Leonardo DiCaprio. So on the left, if you're looking on YouTube, that's the two of them? That's the two of them. So okay. this is Molly, who is the tribe member, Molly Burkhart, and mm -hmm. she marries Ernest Burkhart. And I think he was a driver or something, and he she just sort of fell in love with, with who he was and the support that he was giving to her. On the right-hand side are their two children's, Children, sorry, Elizabeth and Cowboy. Um, and apparently, I, I read both that Molly and Cowboy cut off the head of every single photo of Ernest after wow. it was found that he was found guilty. But th those are, in fact, the, the two kids from this marriage. So they get married, and Ernest is helping his uncle murder Osage tribe members and ultimately kills off Molly's entire family and then tries to kill her. So if you go to the next visual, this is Molly's family. So these are Molly's sisters. Um, on the left-hand side is a photo of Molly's sisters and her mother. On the right-hand side are Molly and her sisters. If you go to the next uh, visual, there's another photo of all of the sisters together. All of the sisters were murdered. Um, and if you go to the M next- Murdered uh, how? I'll tell you, if you okay. go to the next okay. slide. So um, this is Anna. Anna was um, very free, really enjoyed the money, really uh, sort of had a wonderful, exciting lifestyle that, that she sort of chose to live. And uh, she was murdered in a ravine, and they said that she drowned, but she was shot twice in the back of the head. 
So, but because William Kale Hill was so important in the in the town, um, ultimately the people that were um, doing the autopsy on her body claimed it was drowning. Basically, they were covering the murders up. If you go to the next slide or the next visual, uh, this is her sister Rita. This is Molly's sister Rita. Her house was blown up by a homemade bomb that was instructed by William um, King Hale. So her Molly's sister died in a bombing of the home, as did her kids and um, the woman who took care of the house. Her husband ultimately died shortly after, Rita's husband. And if you go to the next slide, yeah. So um, I don't know how Minnie was killed. I did not read about how her third, or her third sister was killed. This is a lineage of William K. Hale and the relationship that he had within the Burkhart family. And um, well, I'm, I'm saying Burkhart, that's her married name. But you can see how the different lines of inherited um, head rights were ultimately coming in and profiting uh, William K. Hale. So wow. you can see Molly and her sisters are on the right hand side. The mother mm -hmm. Lizzie is on the far right. And then Molly's former husband, Henry, who was shot, uh, his entire um, head rights went to William K. Hale. It looks like Hale has a piece of everything. Yeah, a piece of everything, exactly. So if you go to the next visual. And as you mentioned, the tribe had a lot of influence because they had a lot of money. So when these murders start happening, they go to DC and they talk to the um, the president and they hire um, different um, in, uh, investigators to look at the murders and those investigators lobby, lobby the federal government to do an investigation. And so I think it's in 1924, J. Edgar, J. Edgar Hoover gets involved with the Bureau of Investigation. It was not yet the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And so if you go to the next slide. So J. Edgar Hoover gets involved and then he hires a man named Thomas White. So if you go to the next slide, I believe it's Thomas White. And then it's a photo of Thomas White and J. Edgar Hoover. Mm. And Thomas White starts to investigate the murders. And he actually does a lot of undercover investigating. He becomes the face of what is happening. They called it the reign of terror, but he had a lot of undercover um, people working for him and sort of befriending the tribe and befriending the people that were murdering the tribe and collected a lot of evidence. If you go to the next slide. So they ultimately find enough evidence to arrest um, William King Hale, and then also Ernst, Ernest Burkhardt. Ernest Burkhardt eventually admits to the crime. And he says, and he then um, tells the story of how his uncle has come up with this entire plan to murder all of these tribe members and take the head rights. So he incriminates his uncle. Um, he's tried in, in that courthouse, actually, that's just above what is still in Pahuska. So this courthouse still looks over the town. That was such a horrific thing that just damaged this tribe for generations to come. So he's tried, he is found guilty. He's sentenced to a life in prison with hard labor. He's paroled and get this, he's paroled in 1941. I think he goes to jail in the late 1920s. He goes and robs the home of his former mother-in-law, Molly's mom. And he goes back to jail in 1941. Wow. He's then um, paroled later in his life, and he ultimately dies in Arizona. Yeah. Jeez, what a craven, and I know, awful guy. I know. And if you go to the next slide. Yeah. So this is a picture of him later in life. This is Molly Burkhart. Molly uh, was being poisoned by her husband the entire time. She did not die of that. Her priest advised her not to eat or drink anything that uh, Ernest was giving her. And she lives until 1936 and she dies of unrelated causes. And her head rights are inherited by her family. Oh, that's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this is a graveyard that is in Pahaska that has Molly and all of her murdered family members. What's really awful about this graveyard and the other graveyards in and around the o Osage um, County and, and, and tribal land is that you see this 
huge amount of burials in 1923 and 1924, and they're very young. And so without any context, you would go into this graveyard and you would see this huge amount of people that had died. Um, and it, yeah, it would be, it would be out of context, right? Cause it's just, uh, such a grave and injustice thing that happened to that tribe during that time. It started with like a creep, it seems. And then it just turned into like this kind of wanton, you know, yeah, almost unapologetic, I mean, uh, elimination of everybody who was really with the tribe. Yeah. I'm focusing on the Burkharts cause that's what the film is focused on. But again, 2,200 tribe members hundreds of hundreds of them probably died as according to, to it research. was the same plan mm -hmm. the same template sort of being followed yeah. by a lot of different people who and, were working their way into this wealthy tribe and even and and those that weren't murdered still had mass fraud you know uh perpetrated, perpetrated them. against yeah. them yeah so it was just it's a horrific story and i have not seen the movie but um there is a lot of research out there there was a book that was written by a New Yorker reporter, and that book was ultimately made into the movie. Yeah, it's funny. Somebody was saying in our chat that the book is particularly good. Oh, um, wow. Well, the author has a lot of really interesting information and photographs on his website. So if you're interested, I I would encourage people to, to go there and find out more. I was interested in understanding what the title of the movie meant. Uh -huh. So I looked into that and... During May in Oklahoma Hills, blooming flowers die when taller plants, plants crowd them out. And so the Osage refer to that month as the time of the flower killing moon. And in fact, Anna, who is Molly's sister, who died in the ravine from the two gunshots to the head, she died in May. So there's some sort of comparison to, to that time as well. So that's in fact the title of the book in the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, in the chat, now there it is, the movie. Um, that's De Niro and, and you're saying that DiCaprio role is the, is the Ernest. guy of Ernest who yeah. you describe who, who made his way in. He's not a good guy. He's not a good guy. Uh, he's really after he, he admits to everything and he incriminates his uncle, but later in life, he, um, he really takes it all back and sort of says like, I was just a go between between my uncle and the people who are actually murdering the tribe members. But he did in fact kill people and he tried to kill his wife. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. It's it, a, it, uh, somehow I feel, uh, like the Osage story is going to be shorter than the cat story said, Colleen, <laughs> how dare you Colleen with that comment? Uh, Buck says, Mark, it must be very uh, comforting to live with a woman who spends the bulk of her time researching death. <laughs> It's uh, true. Mark sleeps with one eye open. Yeah, it's uh, but uh, really, really impressive. Oh well, um, you. Was, uh, I know you worked very hard to prep. I it. worked very hard to prep it. It's yeah. a very. I. It's a. It's a terrible story. I mean, it, uh, so it, much of our history is awful as it relates to Native Americans and among other people. But sure. uh, it was a, a truly horrible story. And I did not know about this story. I, you, you made the recommendation and I appreciate you sending it to me. Well, no, I mean, very well, uh, well reported and uh, recognized as such. Uh, Courtney, everybody. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you. Thank you for having That's me. That's Mark's Murder Mystery Monday for today. Mark's Murder Mystery Monday on the Mark Thompson Show. And uh, we'll take a meeting on that cruise. I'm not sure um, it's going to happen. I love the idea of uh, sending Kim in my stead. Uh, what do we think about that, Kim? Could that really happen? I wonder. Uh, Albert, I'm going to ask you what I should do now. I think actually Kim had to leave. So yes, it's just, us, it's mm -hmm. just us girls. Um, yeah. Kim had to go to uh, what? Uh, some parent thing, I think. Isn't that right, Albert? Yeah, she had some uh, a prior. She, she, we, we, we knew that she was going to be gone. Yeah, so exactly. Starting, uh... Uh, Mark, can I go on the cruise, asks Tom. Uh, yes, you can. <laughs> I would almost send anyone. Um, why not stream from the cruise, says Harry. Well, the reason is that the 
rate at which you can connect from the internet is really slow. You can't, you can't stream at all. Can't stream video, can't stream audio. So sadly, not an option. But thank you, Harry. I wish I could. Um, on the book about the Osage murders, Meredith says, read the book and it's very detailed and well-written. Yeah. Um, so, uh, interesting. Um, all right. Uh, Albert, without any further uh, delay, I'd like everybody to smash the smash like button. I do want to iron rod. Yeah, smash the like button. And um, we have some uh, some stuff to do. We'll take a short, like uh, thirty second break, and then I'm going to bring this baby home. It's going to be strong. If you're just joining us, we got forty minutes of show, and it's going to be good. Mark Thompson show. With your iron rod. The Mark Thompson Show. Who's Mark Thompson? Hey, which one of you is Mark Thompson? That's not fake. That's real. It's fantastic. There's never been anything like this. We've never seen anything like it before. Nobody has ever put something like this together that I've ever seen. Have you ever seen anything like this? There is nothing in our history that quite compares to this. Big shout out. Google it. I did everything right and they indicted me. I've received a lot of positive letters. I misspoke. My bad. I'm sorry. Where are my weed smokers at? Morning. I don't think you should apologize for how you feel. Did you really just do that? Yeah, we are here. It is a Monday, a uh, disturbing weekend. Uh, Matthew Perry passed away. That was really unexpected and awful. The um, awfulness of the unfolding situation in the Middle East continues to be incredibly disturbing and troubling and preoccupying, frankly. I think about it a lot, and I'm sure you do too. Um, the rise in hate. Um uh, Nationwide and worldwide is insanely troubling as well. And um, I'll get to that in, uh, in just a moment. Uh, I, um, I want to encourage you to uh, contribute to the conversation if you want in uh, the comments, both uh, during the show and afterward. So if you have anything to say, please join us in the comments. After our trading, we do read the comments. In fact, I wanted to share a comment with you. Albert, you'll appreciate this. You're often mentioned in the comments, Albert. You really are. Uh, uh, that last one you read earlier, I was the first name mentioned. I just wanted to put that on the record. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is from Ireland. Kevin Byrne in Ireland posted this in After Hour Commenting. First time I'm seeing this podcast on YouTube, being Irish and always lived in Ireland, watching the American media, or sh I should call it the Murdoch media show, it's refreshing to see a broadcast like this. No shouting. He might have caught a period during which there was no shouting. No one talking endlessly over each other, like Republicans with their motor mouth saying nothing except lies and looking for ratings. There is, after all, and there are intelligent people in America. We look at our politicians and what they should be doing, but compared to America, American politicians, it makes ours seem like intellectual giants in comparison. Which, of course, they are not, he says. It's comforting that the senators and Congress people and presidential candidates, especially the Republican ones, 
uh, leave out Trump and Gates and MTG and those white supremacists who will use anything to show how ignorant they are, they belong in straitjackets. None of these people would be tolerated in Ireland. It's just not in our DNA. That's interesting. It's only when we emigrate to America that we turn into some weird version of ourselves. Anyway, thanks for this broadcast. We may know all of what was said already, some of us anyhow, but it's important to know that what we see endlessly in the media is not the real world, that people strive to do what's best and that these fools are not worth the time of day. Keep up the good fight. That's from Kevin. Uh, and again, that's just a public comment. It's interesting. I, yeah, I mean, it's very not, you of course take the compliment, but I also was struck by the notion somehow that it's better there than it is here. We do this thing. We've talked about it before. The, myth of American exceptionalism, right? This we're taught very early on. We're the country of freedom. You know, Superman fights for truth, justice, and the American way. I mean, that's a real propaganda machine that we begin to believe. We There's always a reason given for all the things that America does when we fight fights and we go in places into countries with our military. It's the righteous fight. It's because we're trying to represent justice and morality. And we just know that that's not true. Uh, and so you look at other nations, and I wonder. I mean, we have evolved in so many ways, this system of government, but has it really evolved to a place that's better? It seems to have devolved in the last few years. I mean, extremism in this country is far louder than it was before, and I'd suggest has much more momentum than it had before. So when I read a comment like that, it lands with me. Um, now, don't get me wrong, Ireland, just to pick this you know, one spot from which he's commenting, they've had their extremism, right? I mean, this, uh, the Catholic Protestant terrorism, violence, and that took place in Ireland. I mean, those were religious tribal factions, if you will. It's so clear, isn't it, to you, that we're tribal, you know? We as a species are tribal. And so these lines that are drawn between us are tribal. We do it, leave apart religion. How about just GOP Democrats, the left and the right? Now, don't misunderstand me. You need some way to describe, you know, from what direction a political perspective is coming. But the, the hatred that's stoked is scary. And I feel as though we've seen it clearly over the last decade be stoked in ways that we have not seen in recent history. So I think that the world of disinformation has been immensely helped. That is to say, in a bad, it's a bad thing disinformation is getting out there and landing in ways that it didn't before because of social media. I mean, I know we hang a lot of the ills of society on the hook of social media, but I think it's a fair place to hang them. So, you know, how to undo this and how to temper this, you just hope that more com conversation and more commenting helps blunt the disinformation, the facts help blunt the disinformation. But when I look at the protests now around what Israel's doing, and when I see people with posters around policies on the part of the Israelis and Middle East politics generally, I see some people who know the whole story or enough of the story and some people who are just at a rally. And that's scary. Because when you're calling for death to another tribe or when you're implying violence to another tribe, another religion, Israelis, Palestinians, whatever it may be, but in this case it's Israelis and Palestinians, it's a, it's a really serious thing that the whole story isn't known. And so it comes to the rise of anti-Semitism worldwide. Over the weekend, there were incidents all over the place. 
Now, there have been incidents in and around college campuses. This is oftentimes where there is a lot of activism. But we had the story last week in multiple places, the the calling for the death of the Jews. I mean, that was a that's a protest. You can say that on a college campus. I mean, that's outrageous. I mean, I get it, free speech, but you've got to draw the line somewhere. And it's it's beyond outrageous. It's grotesque. It's horrible. It's beyond the pale. It should not be tolerated. But let's not conflate that and the peaceful protests that are going on all over about the American support of Israel's now aggressive moves into Gaza to root out Hamas and to get those hostages back. That now has been joined worldwide and then perverted into violence against Jews. Straight up Jew hating, anti Semitism. Here is what happened in Russia. This is in this Dagestan region, which is a heavily Muslim region of southern Russia. And literally, they think a plane from Israel has landed, and they storm the airport. Look how many people there are. And they're trying to drag passengers on this flight off of this flight, checking passports. The plane was targeted by an anti-Semitic mob. They demanded to see passengers' passports. This is a flight from Tel Aviv, and they're caught in this chaos. People stormed the airstrip. Here you go, Albert, please. Turning now to a disturbing situation in southern Russia where an anti-Semitic mob stormed an airport yesterday looking for Jewish passengers on a flight from Israel. 20 people were injured. It was a moment with troubling echoes of the past. Holly Williams has the story. <laughs> Video posted on social media appears to show a frenzied mob storming the main airport in the Dagestan region of southern Russia, searching for Israeli passengers and surrounding a plane that reportedly arrived from Tel Aviv in Israel. Where did the passengers go? They yell at this airport staffer. I don't know, he tells them. Inside this plane, the captain tells his passengers to stay calm. Please don't try to leave, he says. There's an angry crowd. Dagestan is a majority Muslim region. And in Moscow, Russia recently hosted a visit by leaders of Hamas, the militant group behind the deadly attacks in Israel on October 7th. But Russian officials have condemned this attack, calling it a gross violation of the law and detaining 60 people. Amid a worldwide upsurge in attacks on Jewish people, the US said, quote, there's no excuse or justification for anti-Semitism. For CBS Mornings, Holly Williams, London. So there you go. I mean, that is a frightening... It's a frightening scene and it's a frightening narrative that is quite reminiscent of pre-war Europe. I mean, it, this is the sort of anti-Semitism that you saw fueling pogroms, fueling organized efforts to root out Jewish populations and perpetrate violence against them. And honestly, it's on the heels of the Hamas attack on October 7th, which was also eerily familiar. Going house to house, killing everybody in the house, men, women, children, you know, the, the violence, absolutely unspeakable, awful, right? So it was, you know, against that backdrop that I was reading any number of things this, this weekend, and I was trying to find something that maybe you weren't aware of or hadn't seen, you know, and I, I hadn't seen this, and so I... Um, I thought I'd share part of it. 
Uh, some leftists are framing Hamas's killing of 1,400 Israelis and abduction of 20, 222 more as decolonization, believing they're championing the cause of oppressed Palestinians. In reality, this is a ding on the left a little bit. These leftists are condescending to them. Mass murder, these leftists suggest, is the understandable consequence of Jewish, quote, colonization. Such a perspective is deeply insulting to Palestinian humanity. It implies that Palestinians are so controlled by circumstance that they lack agency. It implies that Palestinians cannot be expected to behave according to the same ethical standard of those who refrain from mass murder. The argument that terrorism is an understandable or justifiable reaction to an insidious root cause is nothing new. Just days after 9-11, Susan Sontag infamously criticized public figures and TV commentators for feeding the American people self-righteous drivel and outright deceptions, that's a quote, about the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Far from a cowardly attack on civilization or liberty, she argued that the attack on 9-11 that killed nearly 3,000 civilians was, in fact, a strike against the world's self-proclaimed superpower, undertaken as a consequence of specific American alliances and actions. That's a quote. The implication, not unique to Sontag, but prevalent among some on the left, is that the act of killing thousands of civilians en masse and unawares is understandable if the perpetrators are Arab. There is a kind of patronizing racism in the idea that slaughtering innocent people equates to noble freedom fighting, as if this were the only way to respond to oppression. And he goes on. The root cause, I'm skipping now, just giving you excerpts, but you see how this is a complicated issue, and I think we're hearing such a limited perspective often. He goes on, the root cause, in quotes, the root cause reasoning we learn in sociology class has or should have limits. Barbarism is not progress. Few of those who celebrate savagery in theory would do so when faced with its reality. How many people cheering on Hamas as noble freedom fighters could seriously imagine pumping their fists while watching the men on their way to murder Jewish teenagers at a music festival? The abstract, scholarly, Latinate air of the word decolonization is a kind of fig leaf, functioning to, in the parlance of the hard left, distract from actions that are inexcusable in any sane person's mind. There is laziness also in framing barbarism as progress. Political rebellion can often be driven by the warm comforts of a group membership and the self-affirming pride and feeling enlightened rather than by any feasible political goals or plans. And he goes on, he quotes Eric Hoffer, the guy who wrote that book called The True Believer. And I just see what we did after 9-11, how many people enlisted in the military, how the narrative became, what are we going to do? What is America going to do? And the flex after 9-11 was awful. Afghanistan, Iraq, it was awful. It was completely wrong. In the same way that this is a doomed effort on the part of the Israelis to go into Gaza. The answer to this situation is, I think, hidden. I think it's, as I've told you before, a a situation in which there are no good options. There are hostages. Hamas is saying 50 of them were killed in the, you know, by Israeli bombing. Hamas is, a, is an unreliable, it's true, narrator in all of this. And even the Israelis are unreliable on some level, although they, to be fair to Israelis, they have a free press. There are ways to check what's going on in Israel. But look, going into Gaza and slaughtering either from the air or in any other way, all of these civilians, it's, it's a doomed, doomed strategy. And Netanyahu is a bad, bad guy. His policies on the West Bank have been bad, bad. 
many in Israel don't support Netanyahu. He certainly is, was not popular in this moment. And then you come to the clear failure on the part of the Israelis to protect their own population. You know, what was going on there on the Gaza border, which was first breached, was supposed to be this monitoring of the Gaza border through technology. They had like automatic cameras and supposedly automatic weapons trained on the area. They had this whole uh, ridiculous, I say ridiculous because it clearly failed them, way in which they were going to monitor this border and protect their people. It didn't work at all, right? I mean, not only did it not work, but you've got so many hostilities being handled in so many different ways in a distracted government with Netanyahu trying to work around the Justice Department that they completely dropped the ball on protecting their own population. This from the military that is extolled as one of the best in the world. Under Netanyahu, Israel lost its way just even in protecting its own population. Leave aside the Palestinian issue. But on the Palestinian issue, they've been miserable as well. So now back to anti-Semitism. The one thing I didn't know, honestly, was how completely how completely proliferating anti-Semitism is, how it's everywhere. I mean, it's insane. I mean, you, you can't tell me that these people who are storming the plane in Russia and on these college campuses, you know, know everything they need to know that they're doing it as a result of some, um, you know, ad allegiance to an issue. I, I think it's oftentimes straight up tribalism. I really do. And since the beginning, you know, the ostracization, the then perpetration, perpetration of violence against the Jews, it's been out there in such a big way. And now you have a hook on which to hang it. And for that, you can blame Netanyahu and Hamas. Hamas got this whole thing started. They don't want peace in the region. And then you can blame the Israelis for sleeping on Hamas and the Americans as well. You know, American intelligence is supposed to be so great also. We as a country are supposed to be also working in league with the Israelis. You know, monitoring communications between Iran and Hamas and Hezbollah. This is a, lastly, a very serious thing because these are not your daddy's terrorist groups. They are armed with technological experience now and with training as a result, and we've told you about that as well, in Iran, training both in Iran and in Gaza that has provided them with a level of sophistication militarily that makes them a far different force than they were back after the Yom Kippur War and any other skirmish that Hamas or Hezbollah has been part of. If this region blows up this way, and if this conflagration begins to include others, it's, it's serious. I mean, it's serious on a world stage, and it will only fan the flames of this Jew-hating that's going on. It, it's unconscionable absolutely unconscionable. And again, there's no excuse for it. So that's the way I see it. I have tons of things I could read you and fragments of this and that, and I will continue, I'm sure, in the, in the days to come. But I, I'd love a dialogue between us. And uh, sadly, as I speak to you now, I can't really watch the, um, watch the comments section, but I'll look at it later. And Albert's watching it as well and we can uh, begin to get into this more. But um, this whole thing makes me so sad. So that's uh, a word or two about what's going on in the Middle East and worldwide with the Jewish community. The Mark Thompson Show. It is uh, on Mondays, every, what is it, every couple of Mondays that we uh, welcome in this lady. She's so cool to... Uh, 
take her activism and her orientation and understanding of animal uh, issues and uh, bring them to us. Uh, she's Karen Dawn, everybody, and uh, she's standing by. I think she's uh, back and forth between, I don't know, you're Texas, you're in California. You, uh, you move around. But it's great. Texas to have you here. today, mate. Yeah. Texas today. Around. Love it. Yeah. You can all go to hell. I'm going. Y'all can all go to hell, and I'm going back, back to, to Texas. Texas. Right on, baby. Right on. Um. So, uh, Karen, in all of this uh, troubled world that we find ourselves, uh, you focus on animals, and they have Thank had you. a pretty bad. They've had a pretty bad deal uh, for a long time. And I'm listening to your thoughtful, thoughtful take on what's going on in Gaza and, and Israel and the Palestinian people and the Jew hating. And I'm just wondering with the way humans treat each other, how how are we gonna get them to care about what happens to animals? It's just mark, you know, it's it's hard. Um, it's interesting, you know, but, you say that. I, I have to, I'm sorry to interrupt you, and then I promise no, you I no, won't no. interrupt again. But it, it's interesting because when I see things like major world events, like floods or fire, uh, I see certain people in the midst of flood and fire, both of which uh, I, I've been victimized by, and they run to try to get the animals out to protect the animals too. They're people who are, you know, like yourself, who are who feel responsible because they know that in the fleeing, usually the animals are left behind. The horses are left tied up. The, the pigs are left locked in the pens as the floodwaters rise. Um, and, and oftentimes there are those who, you know, try to make a difference in those creatures' lives. Sadly, when I look at Gaza, I think, well, everybody's running uh, and, you know, there's going to be carnage and it's going to be four-legged and two-legged. Mark, you are one of the least interrupting men I've ever known, and your interruptions are always so thoughtful, and I love having a, a conversation with you about all of this, so don't say you'll never do it again. You have to do it sometimes. Um, and it's funny. I just said, how are we going to get people to care about animals with, with they don't even care about each other? And then you mentioned what you just mentioned, and this is the odd juxtaposition that it's so true that, you know what, people do care about animals much more than the government would, than our laws would suggest that we do. For example, um, whenever there's a, a uh, any sort of emergency, and I'm thinking about the Hurricane Katrina floods and all the disasters that have happened since then, when people are fleeing their homes, they don't take their television, they don't even take their photo albums, they take their animals. So we do understand that they are part of our lives, that we care about them deeply. And then you have these crazy situations. In fact, we had one um, leaving Israel recently where the um, American government was not allowing people um, fleeing Israel to take their animals with them on the plane as if their lives haven't already been horrendously turned upside down. These are people who've lost relatives in those attacks on October 8th, and they're fleeing, and some of them are coming back to America. And then the government says, well, yeah, but, you know, humans first. You can't take, um, you know, your, your children haven't had enough trauma, having lost their aunts or uncles or whatever. Um, we're going to take their their dogs and cats away from them too because, you know, somebody on the plane might not appreciate having a dog there. And I'm just like, there's the laws and the people who make them are out of touch with how people do view animals. But uh, That's a great point that, that people grab their animals first. I didn't even, it's so funny. It's always what they tell you. Well, grab your yeah. animal. You know, they even say it, you know, grab your animals and then you're like whatever, prescription medications, you know, when you're evacuating, whatever. But you're right. I never even considered the fact that that clearly reflects Grab your animals if That's you're allowed to. <laughs> if you're allowed to. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. And uh, it's funny. I remember after her Hurricane Katrina, a lot of people got killed and didn't leave their homes because they were not, the Red Cross shelters at those times were not allowing animals in. And I had a lot of friends. I had a lot of friends down there in the days after Hurricane Kane, Katrina rescuing animals, and I was writing as I do, and I had a, a piece in the Washington Post at that time um, talking about the way that this policy of the Red Cross not to allow you to take your animals 
how it affected humans and how it even killed humans. And it killed specifically um, lower income humans because if you were rich, you bled and you went to the, the local dog friendly Marriott. But if you were relying on the uh, Red Cross shelters, you, you couldn't leave unless you were willing to leave your animals, which an awful lot of people aren't. So and I'm not talking about vegan people. I'm just talking about people who view their dogs and cats and, as beloved um, family members, which many, many, many people in America do. Oh, of course. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, uh, it's a connection that we feel, you know, and it's, uh, it's powerful. I was talking to right. my... my um, partner on the radio in Los Angeles, uh, Tim Conway Jr. He said when his cat died, he cried more than when his mother died. And he said well, that on I'm the radio. Well, I'm hoping he wasn't sleeping with, with his mother for the last uh, 20 years. No, you're right. But that's, uh, you're saying that that, that bond is created over those that time by sleeping in the same bed with your animal, etc. But it was just an interesting... Uh, of course comment from a guy who's not you know he's not vegan and he's not like an animal he <laughs> just but he speak he was speaking to the to the connection you know it's a real connection after uh, buster dawn who was the love of my life died um i had a piece in the local palisades paper um and i dared to say that i had never felt more bonded to another being than i had to buster um, because sure, I had family members, but I wasn't sleeping with them every day and every night. And um, I actually had, because there was a photo of me and Buster in the paper together, I had strangers coming up to me on the street and hugging me because I dared to say that out loud because they had felt it, but felt you're not allowed to say it. And uh, I'm, I, I'm loving this conversation, but I, I want to get on to something going on in the news, which I, I know is my, my job here is to talk about animal news to some extent. Um, last week, you and I spoke about uh, the possibility of a court case coming up that would possibly grant elephants rights. And we had noted, as was noted in the paper, that one of the reasons that they had singled ele elephants is that elephants had been proven to have a sense of self, that they recognize themselves in the mirror. Well, this week, The Guardian has published that, and it's funny, again, science takes a while to, to catch up to things that some of us already know. And those of us who have had pet birds know that um, this is not a surprise. But The Guardian um, came out with an article this week that showed that chickens can are, are apparently well aware that another chicken, that the chicken in the mirror is not another chicken. So it's the same idea of a sense of self. I don't know, Albert, if you have that article from The Guardian I sent over. If not, uh, oh, here we go. Uh, no, that's yeah. no, no. <laughs> no, no, that's not it. Yeah, you know what? I'm not fair to Albert. I tell him we're going to go with one thing, and then then I just assume oh, he's... Oh, you pulled a bait and switch on Albert. That's I not... Do, uh, I do it all the time. I'm the only uh, one allowed to do that. Albert, thank you. I, um, yeah. But Al, but you know what? I'll tell them about the the, the chicken story, and we'll have that video um, shortly, if we may. But the um, so the Guardian came out with a piece saying that uh, when uh, here it is that uh, chickens apparently chickens have a sense of self, and that they know that they can recognize themselves in the mirror, and know that it is not a different bird who is in the mirror. The way that they know this is that when um, there's a hawk going overhead. Um, chickens will alert each other with a call. And I know this from my days of rescuing turkeys, which sometime in November we will most definitely talk about. And when an airplane goes overhead, the turkeys will make that very, very specific hawk, hawk, hawk uh, call to each other. And what I didn't know is that if they are alone, if there's no other turkey or chicken around, they won't make it because that's just basically alerting the hawk saying, here I am, whereas there's nobody else to warn. And if um, roosters have a big mirror next to them, and so they're seeing what we might think they would see as another uh, rooster or chicken, they will not make that sound. They're apparently quite well aware that it is not a different uh, chicken or rooster and that reason that exactly as we work out eventually that the reason that the uh, um, other bird is doing exactly what they are doing is because oh it's me in the mirror so they've done various tests to figure that out 
reason I think this is so important to discuss is we're talking about, you know, the need to give elephants rights because they're so intelligent and they recognize themselves in the mirror. We are going to get to the point, Mark, where we realize that this is the this is the case for all animals. And the reason that dogs don't recognize themselves in the mirror is because they have such darn bad eyesight. I'm so sure of it. And that if we were testing them according to smell rather than according to vision, we'd find out that they too have a sense of smell. And the well, reason- Well, you're the, you're, the, you're the activist, but I would just, uh, I would say this. Um, I hate that I have to justify kindness by saying, well, that's an intelligent creature and it knows itself and they're just super well-developed evolutionary uh, 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 years have led to their intellect. Et I don't care how smart it is. I don't care if that dog is smart. I don't care if the fish is smart. I don't care if the chicken is smart. I care that it feels, it feels fear. It feels, uh, uh, it feels pain. And for that reason, uh, I think, there should be kindness directed toward that that thing. Uh, so I didn't I, again I didn't interrupt. Bless but, you for that. But really, and that's you know what? And, and and anybody agrees with you. You know, you don't have to be vegan to agree with you on that. That uh, that um, beings who feel matter. So the reason right, we, have, I, we have only a minute or two. Do we have? Oh, uh, I'm mother, sorry, I, I, you. Go ahead. I really well. If we can have a few minutes. I wanted to play something that Albert started to put up before about a minute of a man, and he's not talking about animals. He's talking about the Gaza-Israel situation, but I just wanted to share it and um, talk briefly about my reaction as an animal activist, if we if we can spare a few minutes. Sure, of course. Albert, things. have you got it? Uh, right. Albert, thank you. Okay, good. Here we go. As I said before, it's complex and changing quickly. But I promise you, World Central Kitchen will do everything we can to help people, innocent people, who they need our support, food, now, immediately. Thank you for your support. And let's all believe that by building longer tables, no higher walls, by understanding that we all need to respect each other, even if you think different, by understanding that we, we all need to support each other, even if people don't look or don't have your same religion. At the end, it's the only way forward. Longer tables is the way I know you believe in Bolsa and Dragicien because Bolsa and Dragicien believe that longer tables will be the only way forward. Thank you, Albert. Um, thank, thank, thank you. So, Mark, the reason I wanted to share that is that comes across my feed this morning, and I'm so touched by this charity who are intent on feeding the folks in Israel who've, who've lost their restaurants and their way to make a, a living and the folks in Gaza who are being cleared out and, and his whole talk, it's about three minutes long. That's is, Jose Andres. Yes, thank you. And um, mm -hmm. such, a, such a beautiful charity and such beautiful ideas. But of course, as an animal activist, I'm watching this and I'm loving one of the basic tenets, which is who cares where you are if you're a starving child, we're gonna try and feed you. And then I'm like, who are we feeding them? And I, I don't expect everybody to feel this way. But, and again, it's not, you must be vegan because I actually, I don't, one of the main reasons I don't yell at people to, to be vegan is because it doesn't work. and. Um, that another time I want us to have a talk about cultured meat because I suspect that is the way forward because people aren't all going to go vegan. But I get so concerned that a beautiful man like this who is so um, intent on feeding people on both sides will still somehow be able to close his heart to the animals and I'm not talking about the fact that he's feeding people animals. I'm talking about the way we treat these animals. And I shared with Albert a couple of photos of factory farming. And it isn't just, it isn't that we're eating other creatures. It's the way humanity chooses to treat them. 
It's unconscionable. We give them lives that are not worth living. And in order to do that, we have to close our hearts to their suffering. And then how can we be, because we know that they suffer, what we were talking about at the beginning here, um, just that um, we have family, this, these are the turkeys, and I'm going to talk to you another time about turkeys and their, how much they love to cuddle and hang out where the action is. And these are the guys being bred for Thanksgiving, and these are the lives that they are being given, and lives worth than death. And in order to do that, we have to close our hearts to the suffering of animals who we know suffer the way that we know that our cats and dogs suffer. And then how can we be surprised given that we do that three times a day when we sit down for a meal or that somebody as kind as uh, the people in charge of these charities um, are feeding animals without looking to see where they come from? How can we be surprised then that um, people who we would think would be kind, can be making excuses for killing children, whether it be uh, Palestinian children or, or teenagers in the Gaza Strip, because, well, they're not exactly like us. And so this is, when I share that, and I share that video, it's just a call for people to open up their hearts to all who are different, whether it be um, people from different nations, or, or I would call them people from different species. And to the extent that we, have those relationships with our dogs and our cats and our birds, we know that they are more or less people from different species. They're not. Yeah, it's a species. It's a speciesism that, that happens. I mean, to, to throw another ism at it, but it really is. Uh, we're out of time. I, uh, I think that's a great point, and it's one that I hadn't considered. Jose Andreas is sort of this celebrated guy, as you say. He, you know, he doesn't pick Beautiful. sides, he feeds everybody. But you're right, the price of that food is overlooking anyway. I mean, at least acknowledge the horror that goes into that food, is your point. Um, Karen, and we could do better. Yeah. Uh, the Daily Animal World News Watch, Dawn Watch, is Karen Dawn. We give you a little dose of it, something to think about. You don't have to change your ways, but it's something to think about. We've got a lot of reaction. Um, and uh, I was trying to find you a couple of comments, but... Um, uh, I'm have, super interested in people's take and maybe we next have two week chickens for eggs. They are friendly, but not on the level of our dogs, <laughs> but they know us. We let them out. They come up to us for attention, etc., And we treat them well. Chickens are beautiful, says uh, Doug. Oh, you get a little more love, Karen, than I thought. I thought oh, you're going to get the, hey, you know, I thought you're going to get a tough time from my audience. But uh, Judy says the only Your thing that attracts me to vegan food is that I know it's dairy free. I'm lactose intolerant. But I've got no qualms about eating meat. And so you see, it's the full range here on uh, on our program. And, but and you know yeah. what? I love that. It's I'm not trying to tell anybody to feel differently, but trying to get people to make choices yeah, that are in line to, with their own values. Right. I've had some great rescue dogs in my life. Russ says I think they're they actually rescued me. Isn't that um, yeah? And finally, Doug says, Mark, your guest looks great in purple. I hope that's not an inappropriate <laughs> comment. So there you go. All right. How Finish dare with, somebody pay me a compliment? <laughs> Finish with a compliment. <laughs> uh, Karen, thank you. And I look forward to uh, your next visit. Um, you can, again, find Karen Dawn. Google her. She's on Facebook with a very um, lively you know, Facebook page. Dawn Watch is the, uh, the name of it. And we appreciate you so much. Karen Dawn, everybody. Bye, Karen. Yes, I'm really unhappy with everything I've heard today on your show. Well, this is a, uh, Albert, this is the, the big finish here. I don't know. Um, and did you plan a big finish? Pinky, yeah, that's a good way to go out, Albert, with a little bit of a big shout out. Dollar a day from Pinky Cerritos. How about Ron Cook with a five? Big shout out. Thank you with the super sticker, uh, Ron. You know, we are crowdfunded and completely demonetized as a result of talking about the horrors of the world. <laughs> you know, you see it. Advertisers on YouTube, they don't want to go near things that involve, you know, violence or, you know, uncomfortable facts. And so as we have to deal in uncomfortable facts increasingly to have any kind of honest conversation about what's going on in the world, uh, advertisers swim away on YouTube. And so we end up having to count on you more than ever. So thank you, everybody who 
contributes to making this show last. I really do appreciate it. Um, what will? What is that, Albert? Did you have something? Oh no, I think we we got a little into the controversies a little later in the show, so maybe the they'll just turn the a blind eye to that, and we'll, okay. we won't get a. That would be nice, that. Albert. That would be nice, Albert. Thank you. I um, we'll find out. We'll find out. But um, uh, what else did I have for you? I actually wanted to. How ah, we're late. Doggone it. Tomorrow, David K. Johnson, the Pulitzer Prize winner. I don't know who else is coming in tomorrow, but at minimum, you'll have David K. Johnston. Kim will be back. So is Kim going to do the after party live, Albert, or what's she going to do? Is she? Um, I was thinking just... about that when she told us that she was going to duck out a little earlier. It might be a solo uh, John Daly, maybe. Yeah, which sure has its own him. appeal probably to, to, to many. Um, somebody was saying to me, uh, 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 let me just see, it was about Kim. Doug says, respect for Kim taking care of her family. Well, it's like, what is it, Albert? It's like some puppet show or something that she's going to. It's not, I mean, you know, Doug, no offense, but I mean, you don't have to like, you know, she's not getting some congressional humanitarian award uh, for, you know, I don't mean to take any, uh, I'm just saying. <laughs> Kim, Kim, how are you? I'm just saying she's, uh, <laughs> you know, she's chaperoning something or whatever. She's not on a family rescue mission, Doug. Please, come on. Ch -ch 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 anyway, the after party we'll live, live is next. I can all write it and we'll do it live. Yeah, and there is that. Oh, uh, folks in the comment section are saying it's a pre taped show. It's recorded. Oh, it's a pre tape. The after party live is a pre taped show. We'll do it live. I can all write it and we'll do it live. Oh, but it's not live. This is scandal. I can't wait till she comes back tomorrow. I'll have to ask her about Tom Gun. My favorite gun is a Tom Gun. Big shout out. Thank you for the fiber on the way out, Tom Gun. You're awesome for a um, for a super sticker. Wow. Well, this is uh, breaking news that the uh, Ch -ch -ch uh, that the after party live is on. But I'm sure it's still an excellent offering. I encourage you to go over there. They have their own channel. It's called the After Party Live Channel. We'll be here tomorrow. Thanks, everybody, for all the ways you support us in these troubled times. Until tomorrow. I'm Shadow Stevens for The Mark Johnson Show. Bye-bye. Until tomorrow. Out of time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.